Hello everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and today we are going to be reading some bad creepypastas. This one is posted on Reddit uh, under the r slash no sleep, uh, posted by user rhani14 three years ago, as of this date. So this is, I delivered sodas to a strange Walmart neighborhood market. Now I saw this um, posted recently um, when I was looking for a bad creepypasta as I did a Google search and this was one of the ones that popped up. So let's go ahead and start reading it. I hated the new job. Honestly, I fucking hated it. I just wanted to be a writer man. Throughout college in my early to mid 20s, I put fun on the back burner while I slaved away at the keyboard. I wrote everything from screenplays to novels. Always horror. I'd even made some money off it. More money than probably the vast majority of aspiring writers ever will. But in the end, I was still semi-pro, aka I couldn't make a full-time living scaring people with my pros. Not yet at least. You see, Patrick Revok wasn't a household name, and I guess at 27, I shouldn't expect to be Stephen King or Brad Hesco. Especially in today's world, where even the best of us semi-pros, and quite a few of the professional writers, need day jobs to pay the bills. I guess I should consider my passion a perfect part-time gig. The money I got off my stories and scripts was always a nice bonus, but now that my girlfriend Nicole and I were getting serious, well, I figured it was time for me to get that day job after all. Even one that was fucking miserable. One of Nicole's friends helped me get this job at a bottling plant. I basically had to drive around to a few superstores and grocery stores and put all the Pepsi products up on display. The recruiters tried to pitch it as being this serious job full of promotion potential, but I just saw it for what it was, a fucking stalker. Sure, this wasn't easy, not at all, but there were plenty of hours and the pay would be steady. For once, I wouldn't have to worry about having stories sell or doing odd gigs for money. I'd have consistent cash for Nicole and I. So, so far, I will say he's a little pretentious, but he definitely, that's a good cause, right? You want to provide for your family, you want to provide for your loved ones, as everybody does. In a selfish way, I welcomed what I knew would be a very challenging and physical job. As a night owl, I'd even have to transition to working from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. But after hearing people, namely Nicole's neighbors, complain that all I did was write and not make steady income, I considered the job a defiant fuck you to their bitchiness. And I'd still have three or four hour days off where I could focus on the writing. <coughs> I could still pursue my dream of being a full-time pro. Plus, I figured this tedious cell support gig might influence my stories, particularly the characters. So far, at least, everyone here seemed nice, all of them blue-collar, working-class types. I was one of the few employees of a college degree, much less the only creative of the bunch, but I was intrigued by the dynamic. After all the time spent around fellow writers and academia, just joining common Americans gave me fresh insight into the country's hot land. Th th this dude already seems like a jag off. Uh, the writer is making himself seem like, he, I don't know, a narcissist. He's acting like, you know, I'm so much better than everybody else, which is cringy. And we're not even, <coughs> oh God, we're not even that far in. Of course, there was also Nicole and I's future. We've been dating for two years. I loved her. Hell, I needed her. Our chemistry was strong. Our relationship hot and heavy. We were two former hipsters at war with the world, even as both of us settled down to traditional work. But at least the subtle conformity hadn't changed our personalities any. Nicole was 25, an extremely pretty and smart young black woman. She liked spending money, and she made the cast live vicariously. Not to mention she could outdrink everyone you knew. Armed with radiant eyes and wavy hair, Nicole had always captivated me. Her tall, slender frame was made all the more attractive by her quirky fashion sense. I was slender and had a crazy grin. Even though I was 27, I looked much younger, with straight brown hair stylized by spiked bangs, boy's dimples, and bright green eyes. I was unconventionally handsome to say the least. Mm. The perfect uh, character, you know, insert self character, Mary Sue. And when I didn't have my contacts in, I was forced to wear oversized glasses more befitting an elderly rocket scientist than a millennial in his late 20s. So yeah, 
Nicole and I were a cute couple. And even doing manual labor I clearly wasn't made for, I stayed with the job. I wanted to for Nicole. My second day at work left me with my trainer ring. He was supposed to show me the ropes and explain what the heck I was doing. Instead, what I got was a picky ass army bag. A 55 year old man whose 20 year experience at Pepsi left him both in great physical shape and with a comical dedication to a job that illiterate 16 year olds could do. Why does this dude feel the need to like just de- like shit on the common man? Most of the people that you're writing this to are common people who are reading this, so it just seems like you're shitting on all of them. What's so wrong with working at Walmart, dude? If Here's the deal, right? If people are enjoying their job, then let them enjoy their job. Doing this, complaining, does nothing to serve you, but make yourself seem unlikable to everybody else. The story just... The character... The main character, because we're going to be spending the most time with the main character, we have to like the main character, or at least we have to be able to relate to them in some way, shape, or form. There has to be something. This character just seems like, I don't know, just seems like a dick. There's not much more to him. Even villains, if you want a good villain, then you would write them with at least likable or relatable characteristics. This guy so far just seems like a dick. And look how little we even advanced. He just complains and bitches the whole fucking time already. Hopefully it's not going to continue like that throughout the whole story. Aided by his trim brown hair and beard, Ray fit the mold of a Bible be- belt bullshitter, a supervisor who faked friendliness to all the bosses and store owners. Ray's clothes and car <coughs> were always neat, his blue eyes laser-, laser focused, his voice loud, booming, and full of southern charm. You could tell the army pride never left him, and neither did his delusional demands for excellence. Like a meticulous surgeon, Ray made sure all those Pepsi products were precise and pristine. Only this wasn't brain surgery or any other job that required vigorous focus. This was stocking shelves. I actually didn't mind Ray during the breaks, but gosh darn, he was a nightmare on the job. More tyrant than trainer. He worked with me like a fucking dog. After just one day, my legs were sore and my body dehydrated from all the heavy lifting. Not to mention the exhaustion I felt from the countless times I had to redo the store collars and shelves to fit Ray's lofty standards. The sunrise, sundown shift may as well have been a supermarket prison sentence with him. The agonizing work wasn't the only horror either. The time constraint also bothered me. Ray constantly told me to go faster. Considering this guy was a Pepsi vet who moved at the speed of sound, my lofty one day of experience didn't have a chance at matching his speed. I struggled, man, and Ray damn sure let me know. Overall, he was a deuce, the drill sergeant I never won. In just a split second, he could go from yapping it up of a pretty cashier to bark at me to fill up a cooler. Heck, just on the first day, he told me he had severe PTSD, which he could only tolerate by making sure he performed his duties to the fullest. A real perfectionist at his shit job. Needless to say, I was dreading going to work in the morning. And the sad thing was, it was only my second day. So at 5.30 a.m., I clocked in at the plant. Then I made the boring drive to my trainer's first stop. A Walmart neighborhood market. One of those mini Walmarts missing all the cool electronics but still full of the same stressful suppress. <coughs> You'd think since it was only my second day, Ray would let me ride with him. But yeah, the asshole never off. I guess I was too much of a slacker to even be worthy of his precious Honda Civic. So like the defendant prisoner I was, I pulled into the neighborhood market. The parking lot was empty save for the handful of cars belonging to employees. I parked next to Ray's Honda. All of his army vet back window and bumper stickers taunted me like his booming voice was about to. Resigned to my fate, I stepped out into the late night. My Pepsi windbreaker and khakis had no chance against the February cold. Shivering, I walked up to the store's front entrance, only the doors didn't slide. I came to a confused stop. Leaning in closer, I peered through the glass. Under the market's clinical lighting, I saw a ghost town of a Walmart inside, an abandoned village of goods and cash registers. What the fuck? I muttered as cold air poured from my lips. I banged on the doors. The glass felt frozen to my hand. One more hit, and I think my flesh would have shattered like broken ice. Hey! I yelled. With the speed of a wild animal, Ray came charging down the soda aisle. His steps quick. His piercing eyes honed in on me. For once, he didn't look so confident or in control. A frantic turbulence filled his hurry. Strange, since I've never seen the man break a sweat, much less ever get flustered. We unlocked the sign doors. You're running late, his southern accent growled. 
I told you to be here at 5.30. A sharp glower kept me petrified in the cold. Jesus Christ, Ray yelled. He snatched my arm in a firm, harsh grasp. Get in here. I let Ray drag me inside, under the bright lights. I felt sheer isolation. Even the Walmart temperature was an uncomfortable low. Still shivering, I scanned the scene. No one was around, no clerks, janitors, not a single one of the grim, grumpy Walmart slaves. You're so fucking negative, dude. Come on. This, this just, the story, man, come on, dude. It's like, is this going to be the whole story? I guess let's find out. I'll save any further comments until the end. Like bells through a deserted cemetery, corny pop music blared through the speakers. Jennifer Page's catchy crush only enjoyed by Ray and I on this quiet Thursday. The sliding glass door slammed shut behind me. I could hear Ray turn the lock. Startled, I turned to see my fiery trainer step toward me. Ray kept stilling looks around the store, a touch of paranoia to go along with his agitation. Hey, uh, where's everyone at? I asked in a trembling voice. Where's the workers? With fair force, Ray shoved me toward aisle 8, a resident soda section. Just good to work, boy, he hollered. I face, I face his intense baby blues. Do you want me to help? Just go check the damn cells. Ray marched toward the employee's only room in the back, his footsteps loud and furious. Write down what we need. I'll go look in the back. Uneasy, I began to make the journey to aisle 8. I had the walker a prisoner approaching the gallows. The walk of a depressed employee. I grabbed a name tag sticker off of a counter. And remember to hurry it up this time, I heard Ray bark at me. Cringing, I trudged up to the fateful aisle 8. The valley of the shadow of sodas glowed down upon me. There were so many ga- gosh darn two liters, six packs, twelve packs, off brand drinks, and god forbid, those fucking 24 pack suitcases. At least looking at beer got me excited. All the soda did was accelerate my dehydration. And what was more irritating was that I couldn't even drink the expired shit. <clears throat> like a weary detective, I retrieved my pen and notepad. Time to jot down all that I needed from the back room. Unfortunately for me, this morning was a hot mess. A pack of deranged children and lazy stoners must have pillaged aisle 8 throughout the night. There were sodas out of place, some even broken into. What we had here was a Pepsi Cola shit show. I jotted down what brands I needed, and then I hesitated on the hard work. Amidst this chamber of 90s pop music, I deliberated on my dread, all to the tune of Shania Twain's Don't That Don't Impress Me Much. The colossal crash of the back room's doors made me jump. I turned and slowed down and I turned and looked down the aisle. There was a stray grocery cart, even an open notebook on a shelf, but I still saw no one, not a soul in sight, and Shania just kept singing. The only verse I heard in the entire retail castle. I caught a chill. Hiding my trembling hands, I jammed them into my, into my windbreaker's pockets. Restless and cold, I looked right behind me. Still, I saw no Walmart slaves. I heard none of their gossip, complaints, or annoying machinery. Nervous, I speed walked down aisle 8. For once, I wanted to see Ray. At the frozen goods section, more cold air greeted me. More signs besides Shania's adult contemporary approved volume. Glancing down the hall, I saw the double door entrance to the storage room, but all around me was just merchandise. No people. Here it was an hour to daybreak, and I didn't see a single fucking employee. All I saw was their scattered shit. A notebook here, a full pallet there. Shit, I muttered. A sudden slam hit those double doors. Terrified, I looked right at it. The doors were back in place, only no shelf came flying out, and no worker for that matter. Behind Costa's steps, I approached the back room. Sean Mullen's lullaby now swept across this barren landscape, the spoken word vocals like whispers from beyond the Walmart grave. Unease dominated me, but still I didn't think my paranoia was warranted. After all, maybe the employees were just fucking around with Ray? Shit, I mean they loved the guy. As I got closer to the room, I saw a face appear behind one of the door's narrow windows. A familiar glare, Ray. He stood right behind the doors, his fire eyes locked in on me. I came to a front and stop. Ray, I said. Just as Lullaby kicked into its sweeping course, Ray backed away into the storage room, in the dimly lit abyss of spare sodas. Hey man, I yelled, forcing myself to fulfill the duties bestowed upon me with this Pepsi jacket and fucking name tag. I rushed toward the double doors. Hey man, you need any help? Before entering the room, I stole, I stole one last look around the store. 
I was still alone, alone afraid. The storage room was even colder and darker. Basically a Walmart basement. I pulled my jacket in tighter, a thin cover for the chilly draft in here. Tall shelves of shit surrounded me, and the dark, all the wrapped items resembled preserved lab specimens. Hey, Ray, what's up? I said, forcing confidence in my nervous tone. I stopped and evaluated the room. Abandoned carts full of unpacked items were scattered about. A front desk still had open notebooks sprawled all across it. Hey, do you need any help? I took a few more cautious steps. I saw a retractable door in a dark corner. The same door we took to go outside and drop off all of our crates and pillars. And right now, it was wide open. Confused, I stared outside. The market's truck parking lot loomed right before me. And there were indeed quite a few trucks out there, including our own Pepsi deliverer. Through the intense silence, I heard no voices, no footsteps, just the lingering rumble of a truck engine and the howling February wind. Maybe Ray was running around somewhere, I figured, and honestly, I couldn't put it past the workaholic. He was Mr. Pepsi himself. <coughs> I shifted my focus over to our shelves, <coughs> our back catalog of 12 packs and 20 ounces. Regardless of my unease, I knew I had little choice but to get back to work. I needed to hurry up, as Ray would say, or go faster as the neighborhood market's manager would bitch. Because God knows stocking sodas was so fucking important. Back in slave mode, I stepped up to our Pepsi section. Most of the 12 packs looked damaged, but not damaged enough. Apparently, Ray had already taped up the tears. In addition to being an expert stalker, Ray was also a soda doctor, judging by how well he refurbished these gosh darn boxes. Straining, I began stacking the 12 packs on a wobbly cart. I was like a lumberjack stacking chopped wood, only this chore paid less. Much less. The boxes all felt heavier than usual. I figured the job must have really weakened me at this point, or should I say, broken me. In such silence, I kept hearing the cart squeal beneath the thunderous thud of each box. I just hoped the damn thing wouldn't break. At least, with no one here, I wouldn't feel embarrassed pushing this overstacked pile of shit around. Filled by the intense labor, I felt sweat sticking to my jacket. Crouching down, I wrapped my arms around a behemoth 24 pack of Pepsi. I tried to lift it, but the 24 pack was winning. I let out an exasperated groan. Using all my meager might, I finally raised the suitcase. Then a huge crash echoed toward me, a cardboard avalanche. Frightened, I dropped the 24 pack. Even when I heard it burst on the floor, my gaze stayed on the open doorway. From what I could see, several boxes were lying out there in the darkness. Our boxes. Even at this distance, my trained eye could recognize all those gosh darn Pepsi logos, and all the packs were positioned like Christmas gifts I'd never asked for. Thick liquid poured from the bottom of the collection, from the conglomeration of crust cans. The shit I knew Walmart would make me clean up. Ray, I said in a worried tone. And that sound emerged from out there. The chills now overpowered my sweat. I saw a glance around the stock room, but I was still alone. My uneasy eyes looked back at all those boxes. Hey Ray, you out there? I yelled. Signs greeted me, as well as hearing for fear. I took a step toward the open door. Ray? I stopped in a puddle, an ever-growing an ever-growing river flowing throughout the room, but there was no sweet scent emulate, emanating from it. I felt no stickiness beneath my feet. Shivering, I forced my gaze down to the suitcase I dropped, and then my immense horror only grew. The large puddle was too much liquid to be coming from just 24 cans, and in my second gut, I also realized I dropped a Pepsi inside of a Mountain Dew code red. Oh fuck, I, saw, I said through the fear. Panicking, I leaned down and ripped the suitcase's lid off. Rather than cans, I saw 24 individual pieces of human flesh. What the fuck? Eyeballs of sagging skin still attached, a severed arm, even a pulpy heart. Judging by the blue clothes and blood-soaked cap, I finally knew where all those neighborhood market slaves had gone. What happened to them when they were alone with Ray? I looked over at my crammed cart. Now there were bloodstains seeping through all, through all the cardboard. All the logos now glowed with a vivid red. Going off equal parts adrenaline stupidity, I wrote to open one of the 12 packs. 12 mutilated limbs and gooey organs stared back at me. Queasiness joined my terror. Only the biting cold kept me in from puking. I couldn't imagine how foul the stench of slaughter would have been in the summer. <coughs> Pulling myself away, I staggered up toward the open door. Ray, I yelled. I kept, uh, I kept my eyes on the scatterbox out there. The load Ray left for me. Ray, where are you? I cried. Desperate for protection, I pulled, my, I pulled a box cutter from my pocket. 
one raid convinced me to buy just yesterday, and the only weapon I had. Feeling more haunted, hunted than hunter, I approached those boxes. Got started, Ray. I slid the cutter's pathetic blade open. Where are you? Closer and closer I, to the collection I got. Huge tears, huge tears cover the boxes, providing an easy glimpse into their contents. Ray, I yelled again. Outside, I felt the heavy wind cut into me. Only two of the truck parking lot slides were on. Beyond the trucks and pillars, I saw a force polluted beyond grief. Belief. Stray Walmart boxes and garbage made up its filthy ecosystem. I looked all around me, but saw no one outside. The rumbling truck, the low noise I heard. Gripping the box cutter, I knelt down toward the largest box, a 24-pack of Diet Pepsi. My paranoid gaze kept searching the parking lot. Ray, I yelled out. Again, I got no response. No answers on this cold, dark night. Finally, I forced my focus back toward the Diet Pepsi. Just one quick look was all I needed. The present inside was raised to decapitated head. His blue eyes looked on at me, crying for help just like his agape mouse really was. In a color befitting a more gruesome code red, blood oozed from his hacked neck. His beard now populated by crimson specks. All the jagged hacks made it obvious Ray's death was a slow carving rather than one clean slice. Scared, I bolted to my feet. I couldn't help but catch quick, disturbing glimpses of all the other boxes, Ray's other pieces, his hands, organs, and legs, all of it divvied up in 12 and 6 packs, all of the core packaged and ready to market. The truck door burst open, and out jumped a large masked man. He was tall and strong, and fucking fast. The man descended upon me like a savage beast, a hungry beast. I confronted the killer. A cardboard yellow smiley face mask to disguise the man's face. Blood scattered all over the morbid, homemade edition of Walmart's tra trademark Havasco. Now smile of death. The man wore tight gloves. His oversized Walmart uniform draped over him like cultist robes. The store's yellow star icon now doused in cr fresh crimson. Trembling, I held out my box cutter. The blade so far out of reach of the murderer. Get away from me, motherfucker, I screamed, my attempt at toughness about as pathetic as my weapon of choice. In one cool swat, the killer knocked my blade away. Helpless, I watched it fly off toward the trucks, off into the parking lot's dark depths. The man's gloved hand extended right toward me. I got a front row view of his own box cutter. The blade was longer than a Shakespearean dagger, and sharper than one judging with the lumpy flesh glued to it. I could tell the man had customized his weapon, homemade just like his mask just like those graveyard of boxes inside. Like the world's most demented supervisor, the Walmart killer waved the cutter in front of my face, somewhere between a taunt and a sadistic scouting. Horrified, I staggered back. My sloppy, scared footsteps struggled to reach the back room. I slipped and fell down on one knee. The killer charged after me. I saw a faint light glimmer off that long blade, and the masked smile only seemed to grow wider. The man swung his weapon. I rolled away, just missing the fatal blow. Stumbling to my feet, I, I confronted the killer. Our eye contact lingered in the February night. Breathing cold air, I took one last look around the parking lot, around the shitty neighborhood market. No one was coming for help. I knew that much. The masked man lunged towards me. I bolted off for the woods. My only chance of escape. My only chance of survival. Of course, the man kept pace. The world's courageous supervisor was also the fastest. The wind blew back against his Walmart uni making it flow like a vampire's cape. Focused to the fear, I kept going. I had to. Regardless of what Ray thought, I was now going pretty gosh darn fast. Running amongst the myriad of forgotten trash from Walmart bags, I ripped off my name tag. Fuck this terrifying night and terrifying job. This shit wasn't worth 10 bucks an hour. So, what did I think of the story? Well, I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was actually garbage, it was dog shit, um, what was the motivation of the killer, why did they do all that, how did they figure this wasn't going to be obvious, packing body parts like that, and then, uh, just the main character, uh, just, I don't know, uh, they introduced gore and horror, that wasn't really interesting at all, just for shock value, and, uh, the horror, you know, like, gore does not equal horror, something that a lot of amateur writers could really get to understand. And there was no real build-up to it. It was just sort of like, okay, well, here's some body parts. 
uh, Ray's dead. And even all the other characters, the, the main character made it like, okay, I'm this great god, and everybody else is a bunch of losers. And the whole thing about him and his partner being like against the wall, you know, it's him versus everybody else. It's just like, you're just writing yourself out like you're this special individual. And I hate to break it to you, but you're, you're, you're just another common person, one common person. So, and that's not a bad thing. But, yeah. So, I don't know. Um, I guess I'll give it like a 2 out of 10. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Well, maybe like 3 or 4. It's below average. Just say, say 4 out of 10. It's not particularly offensive. Um, not stuff like, like Square Root Suicide is a really bad one. That's a really dog shit one. At least it doesn't go like super far describing the details of the lore. I mean, it's still tasteless, but it could be worse. It could be much worse. I've seen much worse. Um, yeah, make your character likable. And... You know, not to be political, but I, I very much respect people who have served for good reasons. I'm not going to just shit on them because I feel like shitting on them. It's like you wrote Ray in a way that made it hard not to like Ray. Like, he made Ray just bad. Like, you never gave Ray any good qualities. And Ray was just there to be that dickhead that gets killed. That's all Ray's purpose served. Anyways, it would be nice to see what happens afterwards, you know, like, does the killer get caught? Does the main character die? Like, what happens? Blah, 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 blah. Four out of ten.